to the cloud, okay. Um, so we started recording now and I'm gonna start about neonatal encephalopathy. Now, the neonatal encephalopathy is a heterogeneous clinical syndrome. And uh, um, the uh, syndrome is, um, um, it's called syndrome because uh, we don't know what is the cause and what is the reason and, and then what is the, uh, the length of the damage. So uh, that's why it's a heterogeneous clinical syndrome of disturbed neuro, uh, uh, neurologic function in early days of life and an infant more than 35 weeks, um, equal or more. And later we will know why 35 weeks. And it's manifest, so it's a heterogeneous clinical syndrome of disturbed neurological function and manifested with um, difficulty in initiating or maintaining respiration uh, in addition to apnea and sometimes maybe aspiration. And there is disturb or reduce or abnormal level of consciousness, sometimes associated with seizure and the breast tone and reflexes, and also there might be feeding difficulties. Now, the term neonatal encephalopathy is always used. There are many other terms like asphyxia or encephalopathy or hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy or presumed hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy or apparent hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. And the reason for this uh, vagueness in the naming because we don't know the time of the onset, the duration, the magnitude, and the repetition of the insult. We know that there is impairment of gas exchange that lead to hypercarpia and hypoxemia, but actually we don't know well, what's happening. And therefore, um, there are, uh, this is the confusion about the naming. Um, sorry um, for interruption, but somebody's coming and going out. Um, Sorry again for the interruption. Somebody is logging in. So again, I'm gonna repeat that. We are talking about neonatal encephalopathy and it's a heterogeneous syndrome uh, of, of disturbance of, of, of neurological function in babies equal or more than 35 weeks and associated with other symptoms. And the naming is vague. Uh, so some people call it asphyxia and so, um, others call it encephalopathy. Other call it um, HIE. And the reason for this, um, uh, confusion because we don't know the onset, the duration, the magnitude, uh, the repetition of the insult, but we know there is a disturbance or, or, or a problem with gas exchange that lead to hypercarpia and hypoxemia, and this will um, result in, in, in a brain insult. But uh, the other difficulty that led to this confusion is we don't know how to measure the brain function or brain oxygenation or brain uh, uh, cerebral blood flow. Um, so um, we actually, we don't know anything about this, uh, uh, this problem. And therefore, um, the term neonatal encephalopathy is preferred because it does not specify underlying etiology or pathophysiology. So it's very general. So when you say HIE, hypoxic ischemic, you know that there is um, hypoxemia and there is um, ischemia, but actually you cannot measure that and you don't know when it happened. So it's better to use the term neonatal encephalopathy because it's a broader and give no uh, connection with any pathophysiological um, uh, factors. Now neonatal encephalopathy causes by many, the most common is ischemia and hypoxia, but also can be caused by stroke. Um, also can be associated, uh, associated with infection, malformation, metabolism, and also trauma during birth. And it might be due to brainstem damage. Now this slide is very important. Uh, and, and the reason for that, because it shows you that uh, we have to stop blaming obstetricians for these events. And you can see that 69%, 69% of the causes of encephalopathy are actually antenatal. And 25% is a combination of antenatal and intrapartum. And the intrapartum alone is only 44%. And the 2% we don't know. So this is the contribution of the obstetrician, actually. So we don't need, and this is from Australian study. Now, there are many causes of, of uh, um, and, and etiological factor and association, association of neonatal encephalopathy. Um, 
And these are started from the um, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy um, from the socioeconomic status, the background of the baby, the preconception uh, time, the antipartum, the intrapartum, and postpartum. And also um, um, associated with um, 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 incidence of neonatal sepsis and the level of the care that the, um, um, uh, the baby is receiving after delivery. All these combinations of zillions of causes uh, contribute to neonatal um, encephalopathy. Now, the outcome of the um, encephalopathy depends on, um, on the severity. So you can see here from the severest insult of, uh, of hypoxia and ischemia that happened to mildest, um, the first can lead to right away failure of cardiovascular and death, but sometimes uh, lead it to milder. And the milder, um, and the milder, uh, and the milder is, um, um, can actually, um, you know, the, not milder, but less severe, can actually lead also to cardiorespiratory failure and death. However, it can be also, it can, the compensatory mechanism that can lead to cardiovascular uh, recovery can uh, give us what we call it neonatal hypoxic schemenopathy and lead to poor neurodevelopmental neuro outcome. But the other things is that baby might be normal at birth. We don't know how this recover. We don't see anything and baby is normal, but lead to new, uh, poor neurodevelopmental uh, outcome. And um, uh, any of these can be normal too. So the result of the hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy can be death, poor neurodevelopmental outcome or normal. Now, this is a very important slide to understand and appreciate. You can see that there is a blue color, which is a predominantly white matter injury, and it's uh, due to oligo, uh, dendroglial progenitor damage and because they are very vulnerable at this time. And you can see these happen only in babies who is more premature. However, the black uh, color damage is mostly gray uh, matter damage. And usually they happen uh, toward the uh, being term until about two months or three months of age. And this is this type of uh, gray matter injury can uh, initiate a cascades of uh, a cascades of uh, uh, a cascade of and then, sorry i have to admit somebody else's login uh, so this predominantly gray matter injury can initiate a cascade of of metabolic events that eventually lead to uh, programmed cell death or what we call it apoptosis and, and, and that's the reason why we selected the gestation of 35, because prior 35, the predominant injury from any insult that happened to the brain, which is mainly hypoxia and ischemia, is um, white matter injury, and there will be no a cascade of metabolic events that lead to secondary injury. And therefore, cooling of this age does not make any sense because there is no secondary insult, there's only the primary insult. But however, when it's Toward term, or in babies, you know, some people say 35, others say 36, it's controversial. It's mainly uh, a, a gray matter injury, and it leads to a um, cascade of metabolic events that lead to secondary and tertiary insult, which end up with cell death or apoptosis. And that's the reason uh, the definition of uh, 35 weaker, especially when you decide to start cooling. Now, this slide is very complicated, but I'm not going to go to the details, but you can see that there is hypoxemic events um, which cause ex um, oxidative stress and cause energy failure, mean deficiency of substrate, and lead to a cascade of events that cause secondary damage when the baby starts to hyperperfuse and tertiary damage which end up with um, uh, programmed cell death. Um, another slide that show you the cascade of event of gray matter injury, when you can see that there is hypoxemia. Um, sorry again. I want to remove. So you can see that there is hypoxemia, and after the primary injury, there is reperfusion and then start the cascade of event causing latent phase primary injury, and then secondary injury, and then tertiary injury until you end up with 
the brain injury. So here you want to prevent. Here, most of the uh, care that prevent uh, the um, brain damage uh, can 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 be uh, can be done or can take in a, can be uh, uh, effectively preventing secondary damage, um, the latent phase of primary damage, and the secondary and tertiary injury. Now the incidence of neonatal uh, of uh, neonatal encephalopathy is very variable depending on the naming. So if you use the term encephalopathy, the incidence will be more wide. However, if you use this term asphyxia, you will have um, 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 a less wide um, uh, a spectrum of incidence, and also depend on the study. However, you can see it's ranging from one per thousand to about eight per thousand. Now, the clinical presentation is uh, also variable. Uh, so it can be, uh, there is seizure activity. Sorry again, somebody has been in. So it can see there is seizure activity and uh, there is, uh, might be absence of uh, primitive reflexes, abnormal posturing, uh, poor tone, respiratory and feeding problems. Um, a decreased movement, the baby might be uptended, lethargic, irritable, hyper alert, um, associated with low guard score and weak cry, and it depends on the uh, resuscitation effort. This might result in mild, moderate, or severe um, uh, neonatal uh, um, encephalopathy. The assessment um, of the neonatal encephalopathy, of course, depends from start from history. Uh, for example, thromboembolic disorders, um, any previous pregnancy abortions, um, any maternal infection, any drug use, incidence of uh, uh, embolism, especially with consanguineous marriage, uh, congenital anomalies, uh, prenatal history, natal history, postnatal, I mean the resuscitation, and then investigation and, and the assessment end up with neuroimaging. Therefore, uh, the diagnosis of uh, neonatal encephalopathy uh, depend on the following. APGAR score of less than five at five and 10 minutes, plus fetal umbilical artery pH less than seven, or base deficit more than 12, or both. An MRI or a magnetic resonance spectrum, which measure the function, consists with a hypoxic ischemic injury, and there is multi-organ failure. Um, um, and then you diagnose. So hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy is multi-organ failure, MRI finding, deficit, um, uh, more than 12, pH, and Apgar score. And you, you need to know that there are many uh, precipitating factors, but there is also a protective factor of the brain, and that will result in mild normal outcome or mild or moderate uh, degree of neonatal encephalopathy. Um, so uh, we will start with assessment um, of any baby with, uh, by uh, doing umbilical artery pH and base deficit, examining the placenta and umbilical artery, doing CBC, doing blood gas and electrolyte, liver function, renal function, blood culture, coagulation study, and EEG. And then uh, um, we might need to consider um, um, sedation, um, antibiotic, uh, ember air of metabolism, MRI and lumbar puncture, and we might need to get uh, volumes. I'm sorry, I'm admitting another person. Um, um, and neuroimaging, what is the benefit of neuroimaging in assessing, uh, 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 in assessing the, uh, um, in assessing the, uh, um, the degree or, or, or the, the assessment of uh, neonatal encephalopathy. First, it can tell us whether there is original developmental brain malformation. Any stroke, it can also tell us about hemorrhage. Or it can help us if there is any uh, underlying, other underlying causes of neonatal encephalopathy, like let's say uh, herpes, or let's say there is uh, a metabolic problem, hypoglycemia, any other one. Uh, consider that the 30% of babies with encephalopathy have normal MRI, which means a good prognosis. However, the MRI result also affect by hypothermia. So this 30% goes up to 50% when, uh, when we call the baby, but, which means that from 15 to 20% uh, with baby calling may be a normal MRI, although they are already have a brain damage. So you have to be careful when you do calling and ask for MRI. Now, which 
uh, which uh, neuroimaging should be selected? Uh, CT scan, ultrasound, MRS, and MRI. Is the MRI or the standard of practice and the imaging modality of choice? And the reason for that, it, um, it's very sensitive. It can tell us cortic cortical and white matter injury. It can tell us about deep matter uh, lesion. And it can also about, tell us about stroke and infarction. Okay, there's a question here. The text appear so large that a question, so what do you want me to do is to make it smaller? Nalum? Well, let's say Nalum has a question, the text is too big. So Nalum, do you want it, um, um, hello? Dr. Uh, the text of the um, of the lecture appears so large we cannot see the, the the whole picture of the of the slide. Oh, you cannot see the whole picture of the slide. Yes. Oh, okay. Well, let me see if I can adjust that. Thank you for the remark. Okay. Okay, sounds good. I'm going to change it. Is it better now? Okay. Okay, it's good now. Then we're going to start again. Uh, so um, we, we, we are talking about what is the tool or what type of neuroimaging that we select. And we said the best between the um, um, ultrasound, CT scan, MRI, or MRS is the MRI. The reason for that, the MRI is uh, first can give us the idea about cortical and white matter injury, and also can tell us about deep matter lesions. It can also give us idea about the infarct and hemorrhage, and there is any other uh, malformation underlying, or maybe give us some other type of encephalopathy, like hypoxemic encephalopathy, um, hypoglycemic encephalopathy, uh, or infection. Uh, um, it give us idea about that. Now the. Um, Um, I don't know whether you guys see this slide, but the MRI de detection is um, according to the following. You can see we have three colors here. We have the uh, blue color, we have the white color, and we have the yellow color. So you can see that the black color is mainly um, uh, the white matter injury, and you can see it starts very um, small at birth, and it's increased gradually. So the detection rate of the gray matter by the MRI is increased with the postnatal age. However, if you look to the blue, which is the gray matter, you see the detection rate is very high at birth and goes down once uh, we go um, 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 older. And you, and, and you can see after one week, actually, we will not see much of the gray matter, only the consequences. And therefore, when you do, and remember that we do cooling in the first three days, so the window of doing MRI is between three and seven days. And what we do here is on day five. And the reason after first week, if you do, you will only see a gross abnormality like decreased volume of gray matter, increased ventricular size, obvious infarct. Somebody is trying to type on the mouse, who's that? Okay, 
anybody is trying to write um, type on the on the on the monitor uh, please stop doing that uh, I know maybe you're doing it uh, without knowing anyhow so um, I hope this slide is clear gray blue uh, gray matter blue injury a blue color injury white matter black color injury and gross um, yellow injury ultrasound has no indication just in case unless you know you're um, you're suspecting trauma and there is an end and you want to do it quickly you want to exclude trauma your hemoglobin is dropping you do that but it's not indicated CT scan is not indicated in, in neonatal encephalopathy. Now EEG is very important. And there are two types of EEG. There is the 16 channels uh, formal EKG, uh, where you use it for like one hour, especially if you uh, provided it with, uh, with a video uh, recording. And uh, some centers, they have the facility to do continuous uh, 16 uh, channel EEG monitoring, but that will be the limit, limit the access to the head for other things. Uh, but also you can do um, single or dual channel recording for continuous monitoring. Those, uh, the uh, 16 channels uh, EEG help you with the uh, diagnosis of, um, of seizure, uh, type of the seizure, response to the medication, and uh, prognosis also will help you. But EEG, um, uh, which is the monitoring, or and then you can uh, compress it to make it AEG, um, it actually help you in the decisions, especially if you do it in the first six hours, help you with the decision to start cooling or not. And also it tell you the general brain function. And also it can, because when you compress it and it become bland or one line, uh, it help you with the medication. So it, it depends how and what is the facility. Um, in the best, if you have a seizure, then do 16 channels uh, to assess it. If you don't and you have the facility, so I suggest single or do one channel recording to assess encephalopathy, not the seizure. However, the single and dual channel can also assess the seizure, but not as a global assessment of 16 channel. So the diagnosis of uh, uh, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy or encephalopathy due to hypoxia and um, ischemia is um, 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 there should be acute perinatal or intrapartum uh, intra event in babies uh, equal or more than 35 weeks, APGAR score less than five at five and 10 minutes, CORD pH is seven or less, base deficit more than 12. Now it can be deficit, can be access, depend on how you write it. So if you put minus, it's access. If you, there is no minus symbol prior to the number, then it is not, if, uh, say, Ufi, say. Um, so based on, on the deficit, if it's more than 12 millimeter, um, 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 if you put um, a minus um, just um, in front of the number, then you can say base uh, access, but uh, you can use the term base deficit. So if the base deficit more than or equal 12, and if you give uh, positive pressure ventilation for that more than 10 minutes. So again, score less than five, court pH less than seven, base deficit more than 12, PPV more than 10, with other uh, signs of um, uh, with other signs of um, encephalopathy, uh, like hyper alert, lethargic, uptended, and also decreased spontaneous movement, respiratory difficulties, uh, feeding difficulties, poor tone, abnormal posture, abnormal primitive reflex, seizure activity, weak absent cry, and other, and. Um, Systemic involvement like kidney, heart, uh, liver, uh, bowel, um, finding on MRI, and also finding of uh, histopathological examination of placenta and the cord. Based on all that, we divide it to mild, moderate, and severe. And this classification done by uh, CERNET and CERNET and CERNET, and it's uh, uh, done on, uh, oops. Just excuse me one minute. Yes. Sorry for that. Um, 
so Sarnet um, and, and Sarnet divided to moderate, severe, and mild. However, when he did that, um, there was no um, level of care as we do have. So the level of the care and changing of practice and use of all this modern uh, support change a little bit the classification. So not many people depend on the classification, but they use instead um, a modified classification, which is, but there is no universal way to do more modifi modified classification. Um, so I'm going to pass this. I don't think this is important. Now, what is the treatment of? So I hope now we have an idea about what is encephalopathy and how you diagnose it. And now we'll talk about the treatment. So we have two major um, treatment options or uh, uh, help that we can provide to uh, a neonatal hypoxia or neonatal encephalopathy, uh, which is therapeutic hypothermia and supportive measure. And the goal is to maintain the normal physiology and uh, to treat manifestation. So what we do, I'm gonna a little bit increase this. I hope that you guys can see it. Uh, so what we do is um, uh, we have a list that we can select. So we start to whether the baby is qualified for cooling or not. And then we have to tick this and the baby should be 35 and we write the gestation. And then the APGAR score is five and the core pH is seven or less. And the base deficit is here we use more than 16, but you can use more than 12 if you want. And there is 10 uh, minutes of uh, PPV and there is a seizure or a three of any of the following level of consciousness, spontaneous um, activities, posture, tone, primitive reflexes, autonomic, uh, uh, any autonomic, uh, um, uh, uh, autonomic uh, system abnormalities. And then we do this assessment after uh, stabilizing the baby, if the baby is hemodynamically not stable. And at what hour, at one hour, at three hours, and at five hours. And then um, if the baby is eligible at any time for cooling, we sign, we uh, declare the diagnosis, and uh, uh, we, stopped, uh, we stopped the, uh, uh, we have a question, and then we stop the assessment. I know, Sura, I know this very, because it's very small, but what I can do, I can forward it to you later. But basically what is, it's a selection, it's a ticks that you can select the qualification, uh, whether the baby is qualified for hypothermia or not, and then you do it, uh, you do the assessment repeatedly, at after stabilization at one hour, at three hours and at five hours. And when you find the baby is qualified for cooling, you stop the assessment. So basically this is a standard order and I can forward it to you. Um, or what I can do is I can enlarge it like this. Okay, I hope now it's more clear. Is it clear now, Sura? Okay, so you can see that um, um, this is an order, a standard order to assess a baby and to decide whether the baby is qualified for cooling or not. So the baby should be 35 or above. The APGAR score should be five, but you should have two of these only. You don't need all. And with a clinical uh, seizure and presence of three out of six of these. It's not clear? None of them said it's clear. Okay, let me make it more bigger now. Um, that's the, the, the best picture that I can make. Because if I make it bigger as a presentation, you won't see it. Um, so clinical seizure and presence of at least one sign of the, these following. And as I say, uh, you start the first assessment after stabilization, then you do it at first hour, three hours. 
Okay, so I hope now clear, but I hope I, I, later I can forward it to you. So it's anyhow, it's a standard order to decide whether the baby no, is qualified no. for cooling or uh, not. In the beginning of the lecture was clear, now all, all slides are clear. All the slides is not clear? Yes. Okay, because... Um, 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 Somebody asked me they are not, uh, they are too big, so I minimize it. So let's go back to the first. Uh, let's go to the uh, presentation mode. Is it clear now? Okay. So that's the best way that I can present it. I hope it's clear now. But anyhow, um, this is a standard order. You don't need to see it. I can forward it to you, but it's a tick where you uh, decide whether the baby is qualified for cooling or not, and you do it on the after stabilization. I know it's not clear. I know it's not clear. Uh, this is, I cannot make it clear because it's a very big slide, um, but I will forward it to you. This slide, I'll forward it to everybody, okay? Um, I can forward it as a PDF format. This is a standard order of uh, cooling, of decision to cool. So it's basically what is it? Yes, sir. I know it's not clear. Yes. Um, so um, basically it is a tick where you do a check mark for uh, whether and decide whether the baby is eligible for cooling or not. And depending on these criteria that we are talking about. So here's the diagnostic criteria. It's the same, no difference. So these are the diagnostic criteria. We're talking about same, we didn't change it, but this is a standard order. Same criteria, no change, but a standard order which means standard or it's already written, you need just to sign it and take which one. So if you start the assessment of these uh, diagnostic criteria of hypoxia, you do it right away after stabilizing the baby. Then you do it at first hour, at three hours and five hours. And whenever the baby is qualified for cooling, you stop, sign and declare the diagnosis. Now I hope this is clear, is it clear? Yes, yes, clear. Clear. Okay. Okay. So the um, the treatment, as we talked about it, when now we we decided, according to our diagnostic criteria, that the baby is qualified. This qualification can be right away after stabilization or at one hour or at three hours or at five hours and you have the maximum window of starting treatment within six hours especially cooling so the treatment is composed of two supportive and cooling so after your standard order and you sign it and you make the baby is qualified for cooling um, 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 you start cooling and you start supportive measure now the cooling uh, when you start cooling, it depends on your facility and you have to decide whether to do whole body cooling or head cooling. Now the trials and all the studies showing that there is no difference between whole body cooling and head cooling. However, head cooling is difficult to apply, more expensive, make the access to the head for ultrasound, for um, EEG, for, uh, for intubation, for feeding, more difficult. And it's more expensive and difficult to maintain the temperature. But if you have the staff and facility to do that, so then head cooling is not different from uh, whole body cooling. In our center, we use whole body cooling because it's cheaper, need less labor, I mean by labor, I mean nurses, 
uh, and 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 least less maintenance and give us more access to uh, access the baby head uh, for intubation, for example. Okay, so um, first you have to decide to do a head cooling or a whole body cooling. And of course, the baby should be 35 and above. And then your diagnostic criteria that we talk about, pH less than seven, pace excess more than 12 or 16, depend on your facility. And the, the, this can be the cord gas or it's obtained within first two hours. And if the baby, uh, baby received more than 10 minutes of PPV or your APGAR score less than five at five and 10 minutes, However, before also you decide, um, uh, you decide to um, um, uh, uh, you decide to uh, cool. When we talk about uh, PPV for uh, ten minutes, we um, include all whether you use assisted ventilation, whether you use chest compression, or you, you use cardiac medications, um, because you will not use cardiac medications without giving PPV for at least a while, or you don't need chest compression before you already give PPV. So when we say ten minutes PPV. Um, um, this include any assisted ventilation, any chest compression, any cardiac medication. And uh, the indication to uh, uh, use cooling also for moderate and severe type, not the mild. However, because of the good consequences, the cheapness of the treatment and the bad outcome, we, our center will start to cool even uh, mild but on individual basis. But the guidelines, the standard treatment for moderate to severe only. Now in severe, there is an important point here is there should be no gross um, abnormality because remember cooling is to prevent secondary insult of a gray matter, is not to prevent gross abnormality like uh, ischemia, very or stroke, or hemorrhage or clot, this is not that. So sometimes when you have severe, it's associated with birth trauma and severe gross brain abnormality. That should, person should not be cool, especially if you have a complicated with other Martha organ failures. When you have a gross abnormality, you will not get benefit. Um, when you start, when you decide to cool, so you make your assessment, you decide it's a moderate to severe and you decide to cool. So first step in cooling is to do passive, uh, 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 passive cooling, which means you stop heating. And when you do cooling, you need to monitor your core body temperature. So you need either a rectal probe that is used by all modality of uh, therapeutic hypothermia, but also you might need esophagus probe when you do a machine delivery uh, uh, cooling. Uh, uh, now, lowering body temperature to normothermic will alter outcome, but it's reasonable to avoid hyperthermia given uh, current available data. But what does that mean? Um, if you start passive cooling or stopping the, uh, the uh, warmer or your incubator in a baby who is diagnosed with these criteria of uh, neonatal encephalopathy, it, it, you might have better outcome, okay? but it's not advisable. So if you want to do uh, 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 passive cooling, you should continue with the therapeutic cooling. Uh, so in this situation, if you have asphyxia and you don't have therapeutic cooling, the best it would to avoid hyperthermia and to keep the temperature around 36 if you can, okay? Um, considering the current available zillions of events that cooling can change the mortality and morbidity. And therefore, hypothermia is the standard of practice in all NICU and, um, and, and all the randomized control trials. So again, uh, when you do passive cooling, you need to co monitor the uh, core body temperature. You make sure when you start passive cooling to continue on therapeutic cooling. It's not advisable if you don't have therapeutic cooling to do passive cooling. However, if you don't have therapeutic cooling, and um, try to avoid hyperthermia. And hypothermia is the standard of practice of all NICUs and it's approved by randomized trials. What is the benefit? It reduces the composite primary outcome of death and major 
uh, uh, neurodevelopmental disability at age of 18 months. It saves newborns with major disability. So number need to treat is six. The uh, number need to treat is actually six. I'm sorry for interruption, somebody's coming in. Um, uh, and what number to treat mean that to get benefit from therapeutic cooling of one baby, you need to treat six. And those with severe HIE increase to seven. So you need to treat seven uh, babies uh, with uh, cooling to get benefit of one. And this is actually very good, very high. Um, because uh, the uh, um, the uh, significant significance of uh, number to treat is reach one to twenty, so this is only the, one of the rare modalities like steroid antenatal in RDS. This one is number of need is actually very good uh, to uh, do uh, cooling. So you do six cooling for babies, you get benefit from one uh, to prevent death or disability. Uh, also, the benefit um, 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 uh, extend later, so there is less incidence of death uh, for many other for um, uh, you know unknown causes later on life. Also, it uh, gives you better IQ uh, for those. The IQ for those with um, HIE and hypothermic is higher than the IQ with those HIE without hypothermia. Now, what is the duration of cooling? It's unknown. The accepted globally is 72. Uh, and the reason for collecting of this, you can do it 48 hours, nothing wrong with that. However, you won't achieve uh, the, um, the, uh, the neurodevelopmental outcome that you like. If you want to go more than 72 hours, the problem is that you have complications that we will talk about. Um, so the studies of comparing longer versus shorter are showing no much difference. And therefore the consensus is to uh, go with 72 hours or three days cooling by maintaining the temperature of the, of the core temperature of the baby between 33 to uh, 35 degrees Celsius. Uh, now there are two ways of giving uh, therapeutic hypothermia. There is the low cost or low technology therapeutic hypothermia and there is machine delivery hypothermia. So the low cost is uh, using cooling bags uh, and cooling bags mean uh, uh, um, like a giving set, the bags that use it like Mughadhi and you uh, freeze it and use it or use packs. The difference between cooling bags and packs is uh, packs is already cold and to use it, you need to warm it. So if you don't warm it, it's cold. So it's a little bit easier. Also, you can use water circulating cooling caps. So it's a caps, you put it on the head and it's connected with a tube and there is a compressor and machine and circulate. Or you can use frozen gel packs. And frozen gel packs is the same packs that you use it to, to save food. You can use ice without anything. You can use water bottle and you can use face change material. Face change, we will see it. It's um, a special material that when you call it, it changes its physical characteristic and stay cool for a longer period of time. And there is other uh, non-electrical uh, uh, non method. There are many, uh, many other methods. So, but these are a short list of uh, low uh, technology therapeutic cooling. This is an example of bag cooling. You can see that it's a plastic bag of a small, uh, a part that is filled with water and then they cool it. Uh, this is an example of a uh, cooling bag. Uh, this is exactly the same bag that we use it for pizza, for example, to make it hot, but this is cold. And you can see that um, we, we can use it. It's a very cheap, um, it does not cost more than like, um, I think it's a $40. Um, th this is ice bag. This is very important because this ice bag is uh, bendable. And when you need to use them for food, you heat them. But if you don't heat them, they are cold. So you can use them. Uh, this is a cool cup. It's a machine um, deliver this. So it causes uh, uh, head cooling. And you can see um, they combine it with EEG and you put it on the head of the baby and it delivered by the machine. Uh, these are um, um, big size ice bag uh, with uh, 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 fractionated to small pieces so it can be used. This again ice bag. Uh, this is another bag. This is used in, in Africa 
you can see it's inside and you could the baby is inside and uh, they use the um, ice bag and you put it inside in addition to the uh, cooling bag. This is water bottle, like the water bottle they use, you can put a, a cold or ice water inside it and use it. You have multiple and there is multiple sizes. This is what we call it phase variable um, a material that also it's a low technology that you can use it. And this is called Mira Cradle. It's synthesized in India and they use the phase variable, two types of phase variables with the plastic and they put the baby on it. And there is the cradle, which is the bed that the baby is on and they use rectal temperature and they use it. Um, it's a cheap, um, it, it does not need maintenance. It can be used multiple times. It can be cleaned and used. And it's also, uh, when you freeze it, takes up to one week to use. So you can need only to freeze it. So you can use multiple and, um, um, and um, you know, control the temperature uh, as we will discuss later on. So this is a um, 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 phase variable uh, uh, material calling method called Mira Cradle. And you can see they use three. You can put more on it. And then they put um, rectal temperature and they decrease the uh, number of the phase uh, material up and down to maintain the temperature. This is a machine delivery uh, uh, whole body cooling. So you can see the blanket in here and you can see it's connected with the uh, machine and the machine has a compressor and a cooler and it gives the baby to the, uh, it gives the water, the cold water to the blanket and the, bl the water comes back to the machine. Uh, the problem with machine are many, uh, it's expensive, it's not easy to maintain because it contains water and a compressor. So compressor can stop with electricity and water can get infected or it can be blocked by the sodium and also um, 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 it can have a leak and uh, um, also the program can stop working. Um, so um, um, it's very good, very easy to be done, but I need like each time we cool a baby, we need about uh, two or three days to maintain it uh, prior to using it again. So it's very difficult to maintain and I don't advise uh, to use it in, in Iraq. Now, what is the limitation of, uh, of therapeutic calling. We don't have long-term data yet because uh, we started like um, around 10 years ago and we don't have baby um, like an um, uh, adolescent who was cooled and reached 11, um, um, 18 years uh, uh, till at this point. So we don't know the long-term uh, consequences of tea. We, well, we, it has never been used in, in, in a premature baby. Um, also has not been um, used for babies with severe uh, intrauterine growth res restriction. So a term baby 40 weeks and the weight is two kilograms. Um, also it's not known um, uh, whether combining therapeutic cooling with other neuroprotective modalities will help or not. Uh, what are the adverse effects of cooling? Not many. Can we control it? Easy to be controlled. So there is short-term adverse effect like sinus bradycardia, thrombocytopenia, subcutaneous fat necrosis, um, and as you know, subcutaneous fat necrosis can associate with hypercalcemia. It usually happens at the end of the cooling or after rewarming. Um, uh, do we need EEG during cooling? The question is yes but you have to um, decide whether to use continuous or use serial, uh, use a single or two channels AEG, amplified EEG or full 16 channel AEG. It depends on uh, your neurologist, it depends on your facility and whether you have it or not and the access to the head and whether the baby have seizure or not. Um, what type of imaging? As we said, it's MRI. Okay, the time should be, uh, uh, of the MRI should be uh, between five to seven days as we discussed earlier. Um, uh, CT scan, MRI is um, not sensitive. CT scan rarely used. Uh, always remember to treat seizure. The best uh, for seizure is phenobarbitone or lorazepam or phosphenitone. Uh, Kibra or, uh, 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 or phosphenitone itself, um, um, uh, phosphenitone itself, um, is sometimes contraindicated, a relative contraindication with cooling. So it should be avoided um, as best as, as possible. If you want to use morphine, you should avoid. Um, fentanyl is best, better in low doses because morphine is, can protect the brain from the effect of cooling. Um, 
you might need lumbar puncture to treat infection, uh, especially if you have signs of meningitis. Always start antibiotics until you roll out infection by uh, blood culture. You might need consider acyclovir if there is history of herpes. Um, you need to ventilate the baby. Um, best to have a high frequency. You might need um, inhaled nitric oxide because the baby uh, can have pulmonary hemorrhage due to asphyxia. Uh, extra membrane oxygenation therapy is, um, sorry, misspelling here, but is not indicated. And, then, and their study show there is no difference uh, between high frequency ventilation and extra corporeal membrane oxygenation. It's very labor demanding, very expensive, and we don't use it. Now the fluid always replace the volume. You might need to use inotropes to control blood pressure like dopamine, dobutamine. Avoid systemic hypertension, avoid volume overload. That's why always we restrict the uh, total fluid to 50 mil. And if there is hypotension, we give boluses. Also we give boluses for, uh, okay, we have a question. Oh, we'll talk about magnesium sulfate later. We'll talk about these later. But magnesium sulfate is not standard of treatment. We'll talk about it later. Magnesium sulfate can be given to mom to prevent poor neurodevelopmental outcome in a premature baby. That's a standard of care. Magnesium sulfate, four milligram and then infusion, for, for gram, for, for gram, sorry, and then infusion over four hours prior delivery for B major, that's a standard of care. But magnesium sulfate at this point for uh, neonatal uh, encephalopathy is not standard of practice, but we'll talk about it. So you need to restrict the fluid uh, to, we usually give the baby 50 ml per kg per day. And um, if the baby need more volume, we give boluses. I prefer to go with 10 ml of normal saline, not 20. And if baby need more, you can give. Uh, and always remember to observe your urine output. So you can need me, you need me, you may need a catheter to make sure that you are not overloading. You need to monitor the gas. You need to monitor the electrolyte every six to 12 hours. You must also need a liver enzyme and you need uh, also uh, a renal function monitoring. Metabolic problem is very important to, uh, to monitor. Uh, so uh, uh, first you need to stop feeding all, whether you are giving MEF, and for those who does not know what is the meaning of EMF, it's a minimal enteral feeding, or it's a feeding of small amount, less than 20% of total TFI, and is not included in the TFI, in total uh, fluid intake. It's uh, considered as a gift called MEF. Or you're giving BBM or DBM, you have to until the, your rewire and until your lactate goes back to normal. Uh, you treat respiratory and metabolic acidosis by sodium acetate or half saline or normal saline through your lines. Uh, always remember to keep your glucose level at normal level. And remember that 1.7 or 29 milligram uh, of sugar level uh, is what we call it leukopenia, where you start to have effect on the brain. So in the, um, um, but we need to uh, keep the level higher than that. Uh, so in first three days, we like the level to be more than 2.7 or 47 milligram. And after three days, we like to, be, to keep the level more than 3.3, which is 60 uh, milligram. Uh, we can use the, the uh, 10 W, the 12.5, the 15, if you are using peripheral IV. But if you want, need to maintain the sugar uh, more than 3.3, uh, after three days of life, you might need a central line and you, when you're using more than uh, the 12.5. Always remember to keep the sugar intake five milligram per kg per minute. Uh, other treatments, maybe uh, you give some vitamins, uh, you might need hemodialysis in certain uh, metabolic and renal problem. Uh, you might need to serial out metabolic, like you might need to send ammonia level, lactate, pyruvate. You might need to send serum amino acid or urine organic acid if you suspect metabolic problem, because can give the same picture of, of, uh, of neonatal encephalopathy. Uh, again, you have to restrict the fluid and give boluses if you need. Uh, you might need an arterial line to make frequent blood sampling. You need gas, lactate, and electrolyte every six hours. You need blood picture every 12 hours. You need INR, PTT, and PTT every 24 hours. You need troponin, liver function every 48 hours. You need, of course, blood picture, uh, blood, uh, blood culture, and CRP. 
Um, this again is not clear. I will gonna forward it to you all guys. It's a standard order of therapeutic hypothermia. So it tells the uh, health provider, uh, what is the total fluid? What is the type of the fluid? What you are running in the arterial line and uh, the cooling, the monitors, the blood culture, the EEG, all the investigations. So it's standard order. You just need to sign it and all the orders are ready. You, this is, I know it's not clear. So how we start cooling? Uh, firm, you, after you uh, confirm the eligibility, uh, you collect your uh, cool, cooling equipment, uh, you manage the pain, you control the seizure, you give some sedation, you start uh, uh, pre-cool your blanket, you five degree below the whole body temperature, and you need to maintain the temperature between 33, uh, you know, around 33.5 plus minus one degree Celsius. You put your baby on the cooling machine, you um, insert your, um, if you are using a uh, machine deliver uh, therapeutic hypothermia, you need esophageogram um, and you uh, should uh, measure the uh, level where you put your feeding tube or the probe tube or the, uh, sorry, I mean uh, the temperature probe, which is the distance from nearest to the ear uh, to the mid sternum plus two centimeter and then connect the probe to the unit and then do an x-ray, but start cooling before the x-ray is back to you. And you can see the cooling probe is here. It's a little bit down, need to be pulled. I think should be until here. But this is only in, only in a machine delivered cooling. In other cooling modality, you don't need it because you don't need, there is no machine to connect to. And this is the probe. This is the rectal probe that we use. Um, as we say, uh, do not wait for the x-ray to start cooling. Uh, you need to, um, um, if you are measuring the blood gas and you have a machine, you have to adjust the temperature of blood gas machine to the temperature of the baby. And if you cannot adjust it, please subtract five millimeter from PO2, two millimeter from PCO2 and 0.012 from pH for each one degree Celsius below 36.5. Uh, this is, they call it Balderman suggestion. Uh, hypothermia can cause um, some arrhythmia, so you need to uh, cardiovascular monitoring. And you need always to keep the temperature 35 degrees Celsius plus minus five, never goes below 33 because it will cause, um, will aggravate the, hypo, the arrhythmia. Um, if you want to start with cheap technology, use your ice bag, make, make bed of ice bag, put a plastic blanket over the bags, cover the bags with a synthetic sheet, attach skin probe, insert rectal temperature probe, increase the, and decrease the number of ice bags depend on the temperature. Let the temperature drop by uh, slowly over two hours to reach the, uh, your target goal. Don't drop it too fast, don't drop it too slow. Monitor the temperature changes. Remember that the surface temperature changes usually happen prior to the core, and that's the, the benefit of the, of, this, of the service probe. And always keep the temperature uh, when using low technology at 34.5, not 33.5, plus minus five, um, just to give you more room to, to earn, because usually the, when the temperature goes down below 33, it takes time to go up. So it's better and more safe to make the lowest 34, not 33.5. And add and remove uh, bags every day uh, to keep the temperature same for uh, 72 hours. Uh, remember, there might be a um, skin uh, breakdown because of the vasoconstriction, so you need to check the skin every 12 hours, um, or maybe more or less, depend. Uh, baby might develop subcutaneous fat necrosis. Um, it's unknown, but can associate it with uh, uh, hypercalcemia, so you need to monitor that. Uh, also, you might have uh, worse perfusion um, that may lead to fat necrosis. Um, so always monitor serum calcium, that's a repetition. Um, it might cause thrombocytopenia, so we need to monitor the, uh, uh, the, the uh, platelet because the platelet might sequestrate in the liver and spleen. Very rarely called DCI, so we need to monitor the coagulation, INR, PT, PTT, and the dimer. Um, you might have metabolic acidosis because of decreased cardiac output. 
Um, also remember that hypothermia decreases uh, sensitivity to insulin. So if you have hyperglycemia and you are insulin, make sure that when you stop co uh, cooling and start rewarming to drop the insulin requirement. And during cooling that uh, insulin requirement may go up and after cooling may go down. I remember it can affect all other medications. So you have to be careful, especially with morphine, phenobarb and uh, uh, vicoronium, the muscle paralysis if you're using. Um, again, monitoring the blood gas, uh, sorry, the, uh, uh, the drugs. Um, now the erythropoietin, um, some people using it in, in, uh, as a neuroprotective, uh, and there is a trial, but it's not yet a standard of practice. Um, also other people using uh, um, uh, uh, growth factor, nitric oxide, other people using uh, melatonin, uh, they say melatonin, uh, three dose on high dose, five milligram, uh, flat dose for three days uh, can help and the same effect of, uh, of cooling. Uh, that's a study from India. I don't know um, how uh, we can trust that evidence, but uh, if I am in a situation in Iraq and I don't have resources, considering melatonin is a cheap and safe drug, giving three doses by oral three times per day won't be a good, bad idea. Uh, magnesium sulfate, there is a study now done in cool baby, not alone, and they call it cool MAC, um, um, and they compare cooling without and cooling with uh, magnesium, and they call it cool MAC, and it's a multi-center, not published yet, but they say magnesium with cooling is better than cooling alone. Um, now, what is the prognosis? Depend on the degree of damage, okay? Usually if it's mild, usually develop normally. Moderate severe, you might have consequences. Also, severe changes on MRI, you'll have, and you know, EEG, um, especially if you have a, a long continuous monitoring EEG can give you some prognostic prognosticating value, but I'm not, don't know, I don't want to talk about EEG prognostication because it's too complicated. Because I want to give more time for questions. In mild, there might be a learning difficulty or might be ADHD. In severe, you might have cerebral palsy, epilepsy, visual impairment, and severe cognitive and developmental uh, consequences. Um, survivor of uh, neonatal encephalopathy usually have uh, six to seven, uh, less uh, IQ level uh, uh, compared to the babies um, who have no HIE and this occur in half to quarter of children. Remember that most cause of cerebral palsy or later developmental deficit is unknown and remember that we know it's encephalopathy but we don't know when and how and how long the insult is happening so it's very hard to blame any cause. Um, there are uh, clinical predictors. So we have uh, uh, um, imaging predictors. We have clinical predictors, uh, whether it's mild or moderate or severe. We have uh, neuroimaging predictors, especially the MRI. We have EEG predictors. Uh, I don't want to talk about. And we have a biomarkers that we can use. I personally not recommending it and we don't use it, but it's mainly academic values. You can, you can use it and to see the consequences and you can, each marker has its own prognostic value. Uh, xenon gas, calcium, channel blocker, xyloric dose, these had future management. Um, uh, this is from Wad. Um, I, I don't know what to say about that, but it's, um, it's not a standard of practice. It's still, uh, there are many, there are many. If I go to the list, there are, there are, there are zillions. There's calcium channels, you said, there is xenon, there is inhaled nitric oxide, there is uh, magnesium, there is uh, erythropoietin, there is melatonin, there are zillions of things. So, but the standard of practice, the approved is cooling. 
Um, now there is a good randomized control trial of magnesium and, and cooling is going on. There is also talk about erythropoiesin and melatonin. There are many other drugs that, you know, because any antioxidant can help, but none is the standard practice. So cooling and supportive measure is the standard of practice. And I'm 